Welcome to Confessing the Faith, a theological and devotional walk through the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith. I'm your host, Sam Waldron. I'm one of the pastors of Grace Reformed Baptist Church in Owensboro, Kentucky, and the professor of systematic theology at Covenant Baptist Theological Seminary. In this talk, we return one more time to chapter 6 of the 1689, which is entitled, Of the Fall of Man, of Sin, and of the Punishment Thereof. The last paragraph of the chapter deals with the reality of sin in the believer's life, and here's what it says. The corruption of nature during this life doth remain in those that are regenerated, and although it be through Christ pardoned and mortified, yet both itself and the first motions thereof are truly and properly sin. Paragraph 5 refers to something that's said in paragraph 4. I refer to the phrase, actual transgressions. The present paragraph tells us that this phrase does not mean real transgressions. Actual transgression is not equivalent to real transgression, as if only outward sins were real sins. No, the corruption of our nature, paragraph 5 teaches us, is really sinful. The phrase actual transgressions in paragraph 4 simply means transgression of the act and not real transgression. simply means acts of transgression, but it does not imply that only acts of transgression are really transgression or are really sinful. The corruption of our natures is really sin in itself. This is taught in many of the texts which prove original sin. David is conceived in sin. That's not an act. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, Proverbs 22, 15. Uh, Ephesians 2, 3 speaks of our being by nature children of wrath. All of this speaks of the human nature as sinful. It also follows from the definition of sin given above. Any lack of conformity to the law of God is sin. A. A. Hodge says, from its very essence, the moral law demands absolute perfection of the character and disposition as well as action. God's require, God requires us to be holy as well as to act rightly. And finally, in the Bible, the term flesh is often used of fallen human nature. It's often used of, sin, of the sinful nature. If our corrupt natures are flesh, that is, our sinful then, of course, even their first motions, the first feelings and thoughts to arise from them, are also sinful. The specific point of the paragraph is, however, that the corruptions of believers are, in fact, sinful. This is probably asserted as over against those known in Puritan times as antinomians. One of their traits was to so emphasize grace and so interpret the doctrine of justification as to deny that Christians sin or had a sinful nature. Now, the classic passage on this is 1 John 1, 8 to 10. Let me read those verses. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. The general context teaches that Christians walk in fellowship with the God who is light. They walk in the light, verse 5. This means, of course, that their lives differ radically and practically from those who walk in the darkness, verse 6. It also means that they are marked by honest dealing with their remaining sin as it is continually exposed by the light the light of God, in which they walk, verses 7 to 10. At this point, John is specifically addressing the claims of a, of a Christianized Gnosticism, the antinomianism of his day. Its promoters claim to be above sin. John's point is that such claims in themselves manifested the unsaved condition of those who made them. One mark of genuine Christianity was ongoing confession of and cleansing from sin. Two things make clear the indisputable relevance of these verses to Christians. Firstly, the states, statements of verses 8 to 10 are made in the first person plural. We, we, we. 
We read, we read again and again. The first person plural pronoun, we are us, is used 13 times in these three verses. Since John is writing to Christians as an apostle of Christ, 1 John 1, 1 to 3, the reference must therefore be to John himself and his Christian readers. Secondly, the statements about the confession and cleansing of sin in these verses are in the present tense. They're not speaking of past experience of of John and his Christian readers, for instance, when they were unconverted, but of present, ongoing realities in their lives. Verse 9, for instance, could well be translated, if we go on confessing our sins, he is faithful and just to go on forgiving our sins and cleansing us from all unrighteousness. A final point of interest in this passage is that John refutes both the claim to be without a sinful nature, verse 8, as well as the claim that we do not commit sinful actions, verse 10. The teaching of this passage is confirmed by the rest of Scripture, many places. But James 3, 2, for instance, teaches, for we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man able to bridle the whole body as well. The teaching of this final paragraph is an important safeguard against two errors, perfectionism and Pharisaism. It shows that though the standard of Christian behavior remains absolute perfection, the law of God cannot, does not change, and it requires perfect perpetual righteousness, Yet, no Christian attains that standard in this life. This guards the humble Christian against the bondage of feeling that because he still struggles with sin, he is a second-class Christian, or perhaps no Christian at all. It also exposes the Pharisaism, which concentrates on external conformity to God's law and thus avoids really confronting its own depth of depravity. God's law regulates our very natures as well as their inner and most fundamental motions and first actings.